So there's this thing out there called a Raspberry Pi, which for those of you who don't know, is a $40 single board computer that you can acquire and use as a low spec computer for general purposes. They're pretty popular among nerds and other hobbyists for things like automating smart devices and connecting things to a network and controlling things over a network and turning on all the light switches in your house at the same time remotely for whatever reason you might conceivably want to do that kind of thing. You can use them for things like file servers or miniature web servers or media players or development computers or really anything that you could possibly think of doing with a 1 gigahertz quad core ARM CPU. As you can imagine, for a lot of people that includes playing games. For those of you who don't know me, hello, my name is Michael. I like wizards and dragons and making games. I normally post videos about making stuff with Game Maker Studio. Earlier today I posted a video about how to build a game for a Raspberry Pi in Game Maker Studio. And because I don't want to assume that everybody who watched that video automatically knows how to set up a Raspberry Pi, I am going to be doing that today, right now. If this isn't your first time going around the block and you already know how to set up a Raspberry Pi, this video probably won't tell you anything new. I am also not going to be talking about anything specifically related to game dev in this video, although I will be going over a few things that you will probably want to set up if you do intend on going down that route. I am required by intergalactic law to treat this as a cooking recipe, so like any good cooking recipe, you're going to need a few ingredients before you start. One is the Raspberry Pi itself. There's a bunch of versions of it now. If you want to make games, you most likely want a Raspberry Pi 4. There are a few versions of the Raspberry Pi 4, one with 2 gigabytes of RAM, one with 4, and one with 8. It doesn't really matter which one you go with. I have the one with 4. If you want to save a couple dollars, you can go for the one with 2. Like I said at the beginning of this video, this thing is running a 1 and change gigahertz quad core ARM CPU. The amount of RAM that you have in the system is probably not going to be the performance bottleneck. Unless you plan on just having a credit card sized motherboard with a bunch of random parts sticking at it sitting on your desk, you probably also want a case for the Raspberry Pi, although this isn't required. You will also need a power supply. The Raspberry Pi organization sells dedicated Raspberry Pi power supplies. Depending on which version of the Raspberry Pi you have, it will accept power over different kinds of USB. Strictly speaking, it's possible to run one of these things over something like a USB cell phone charger, but you really, really shouldn't. These things only draw something like 15 watts of power, but if your power supply can't keep up with the demand, then bad things can happen. And if your installation somehow gets corrupted because it's not drawing enough power, that can be a huge headache to deal with. You're also going to want the usual computer peripherals. A keyboard is required, a mouse is not strictly required, but it will be an immense help to have. You're going to need something to output video over, at least to set up your Raspberry Pi. Once you have the thing set up, it's not too hard to just run it remotely if that's all you need. So for us, that's going to mean an HDMI cable and some kind of monitor for it to plug into, or a TV screen or whatever. Like with the power supply, different versions of the Raspberry Pi have different kinds of shapes of HDMI ports. Some versions just use a regular HDMI cable, the Raspberry Pi 4 uses a mini one. Keep that in mind when you go to the store. Lastly, you're going to need a micro SD card. The Raspberry Pi does not have a hard drive of any kind, so you will need to supply it one in the form of a micro SD card. The smallest SD card you can use is 4 gigabytes, but that will not be enough space to also install the graphical user interface desktop, so you probably want 8 gigabytes or higher. Certainly if you want enough space to do things such as store and run games on it, a larger SD card is definitely preferable. So I am going to jump back to the land of regular desktop computers for the time being and go look up the Raspberry Pi operating system. So the Raspberry Pi operating system is, as you can probably imagine, uh, a, a variant of Linux. You can install other stuff on a Raspberry Pi. I'm not going to be doing that right now. Let me type in ras Raspberry Pi Imager into your preferred search engine of choice. Go to um, this result should do it, raspberrypi.org slash downloads. And Raspberry Pi Imager is for Windows. We're going to be going with that. That's going to take a moment to download. And when it does, you can run it. And this is going to be an installer for the Raspberry Pi Imager. Once it, once it opens, there we go. This should take a moment to install. Yes, no nonsense, no, no sponsored installation bloatware that you have to deal with. It's quite nice. And that should take a couple seconds. You can click finish when you're done. If you want to, you can download the Raspberry Pi operating system images yourself with uh, one of these buttons or down at the bottom one of these buttons and you can uh, image it to your SD card with a program such as Etcher. The Raspberry Pi imager is um, is a relatively recent invention and it does a lot of that stuff for you so that you don't have to noodle around with a bunch of different programs. So this is what it 
I meant to click the X button, thank you. This is what it looks like. You can click choose operating system. The one at the top is most likely going to be the most recent one. It has recommended next to it. Uh, there are other versions. If you have a small SD card, you will want to go with Raspberry Pi OS Lite that has no graphical user interface, desktop, or anything like that. And there are other things at the bottom. Someday I'll mess around with these to see what they look like and how they work. That day is not today. Although if you're specifically inter interested in like retro gaming emulation arcade machines, RetroPie might be what you're looking for. Uh, so we're going to go with that, Raspberry Pi OS. We're going to say choose SD card, and that is the I drive on my computer. Make sure that anything that you want to get off this SD card has been removed and copied to some other location on some other device first, because this will erase your SD card and replace it entirely with a Raspberry Pi OS. If you have been using this SD card for something like video storage or photography storage or just general file storage, make sure to get that stuff off the SD card and put them somewhere else because this is going to erase the contents and after this there is no getting it back. And then you just click right. Yes, all existing data will be erased. That's what I just said. Thank you for making sure that I uh, don't make any accidents. So this is going to take a this is going to take a couple minutes. It'll take longer or shorter depending on how big your SD card is. I am not going to make you sit through this. I'm going to just speed up the video to something like 10 times. If you don't feel like waiting, you might want to get a book out or grab a bite to eat or go watch some other game dev video in the meantime. Would that cancel verify button just let you skip the verification step without affecting anything else? I've never tried that. I don't feel like trying that. It doesn't take too long and it's probably a good idea to make sure your SD card was imaged correctly anyway. So Raspberry Pi OS has been written to the SD card and I can now take it out of the reader. If you go into the, um, if you go into the, um, whatever this is called, this PC thing, my computer, whatever it's called these days, the SD card will have disappeared. If you plug it back in, it may show up as two separate drives, a boot sector and a, a sector that Windows is unable to access because it's formatted in a way that it doesn't recognize. Anyway, remove the card from your computer, put it in the Raspberry Pi, make sure everything is plugged in the right way. Stick the micro SD card inside the Raspberry Pi itself and then uh, turn it on. All you have to do to turn it on is plug it in. There's no power switch or anything. It's not that fancy. Hey. Let's see if the uh, let's see if the HDMI screen capture works on the first try. Okay, the file system is recognized, and it's just going to reboot real quickly because this is its first time. This is decidedly not a Nintendo Switch. Thank you for trying, there, Wilgato. I think that was the last thing I was using this for. Okay, here it goes. Welcome to the Raspberry Pi desktop. Let's see, I have uh, I have all my, my keyboard and mouse plugged in. I need to make space on my desk for these now. They're on the floor. I have way too many, uh, I have way too many pieces of hardware in here. Welcome to the Raspberry Pi desktop. If you are using the, the Raspberry Pi Lite version of the operating system, you will see a command line instead. I was originally planning on making this video to include that, but I, uh, I want to get through this a little bit quickly today. Also, by the way, what is this uh, what is this picture of in the background? I keep meaning to look that up. I've never looked it up. It'll be on the screen right now, assuming I can find an answer. Hey. So we're going to click through the setup. Uh, you can you can do the setup here, or you can do it through the uh, the config later on. I am just going to do it here. Set up the country to United States, American English, as you can probably tell by my uh, accent. Time zone is, uh, would be New York time. Where is that? New York. I might as well check the English language and use US keyboard options because if I, if I don't set this thing to recognize a US keyboard layout, you're going to have some interesting side effects such as uh, certain special characters on your keyboard not printing out what, they, what you think they should, getting the actual pound symbol instead of the dollar sign, and some other, uh, some other differences. So that'll take a moment or several moments. You can enter a password. The default password is a Raspberry, all lowercase, and the default username is Pi for these things. You can change that if you want. You can not change it if you want. Obviously, it's probably a thing you should do. Let me, um... It's not the most secure password I've ever thought up, but it'll do the job. So I'm going to, to uh, click Next, Setup Screen. The desktop should fill the entire screen. 
it doesn't quite on this um on this monitor I have. I'll, I'll just I'll just inform it of that. I don't think it uh, I don't think it really matters. It will not really affect my user experience. And select a wireless network. You probably want your Pi connected to a network that has an Ethernet port if you want to set up. Um, if you don't want to use Wi-Fi and you just want to use wired Ethernet. Once that's done, update software. The operating system and applications will now be checked and updated if necessary. This may involve a large download. This usually doesn't take very long. You can skip it if you want, but having an operating system that's reasonably up to date is never a bad thing. So we're going to be doing that and it's going to take a minute. If you want to do this in the terminal later, hey. you can do all of this in the terminal if you want. But I'm going to make the assumption right now that everyone is, is just doing their initial Raspberry Pi setup um, right now. I don't know if that's a safe assumption to make or not. I don't expect a large number of people to try and use the uh, Raspberry Pi Lite version of the operating system, because this video is aimed at people who want to build games for the thing, and you probably want to have a graphical user interface if you're going to do that, but you never know. That took longer than I remember to take. Okay, the Raspberry Pi operating system is now up to date. It is asking to restart. Yeah, why not? It shouldn't take too long. This isn't Windows. Restarting should only take a moment. The Elgato capture unit is very confused again. And here we go. That, uh, that did not take long at all. I see the time has updated correctly once it's connected to the network. And welcome to the computer. This is a, this is a very basic desktop computer environment. You have, um, you have your fire ex file explorer, you have a, a web browser, which I believe is uh, some version of Chromium. If it ever opens, I will get a look at it. Yeah, this is, a, this is just a generic Chromium window. Adobe Flash Player, why are we telling me this? Flash Player is like dying at the end of the year. Over here is your terminal. This is um this is this is your bread and butter for for Linux users. I'm not going to get too far into how the terminal works. If you've used Linux before, you know exactly how it works. The Raspberry Pi OS is a Debian-based operating system, so for the most part, this works exactly like things such as Linux Mint or Ubuntu would. The package manager is Debian-based. Um, if you want to do something like install a um, install some software from a repository. sudo apt get Hey. is what you're looking for. Yeah, why not? For the uh, the three people on Earth besides me who unironically like Node.js. Let's see. I can just use it after this, can't I? Wonderful. It comes with some things already installed. Um, there is, uh, of course, as you can imagine, Python which a lot of people often like to use for things like Raspberry Pi and robotics. There you have it. There's an exit. You have uh, the GNU C compiler, which is installed and would like an input file apparently. Um, This keyboard is incredibly loud and I have no idea how I survived before I found a quieter one. There should be a dot H after that. There should probably also be a terminating new line after that. Okay, one more thing that I forgot to mention that you're definitely going to want to have enabled if you want to use the Raspberry Pi and build games to be played on it. So to communicate between two different computers on a network remotely, you want to turn on this thing called SSH. SSH stands for Secure Shell, which is a protocol for remotely accessing different computers. This could be done via the command line or via some config file, or if you have a desktop uh, operating system, an operating system with a desktop, you can go to the little start menu up in the corner Preferences, Raspberry Pi for configuration, and that's going to that's going to open up a little settings menu. Go to the interfaces tab. This is like interfaces as in software interfaces, hardware interfaces, as, as opposed to graphical user interfaces. 
and SSH is the second option. It's off by default, just enable it. Click the OK button, and now we can access this thing remotely. Now, in order to actually remotely connect to your Raspberry Pi on the, on the internet network, you will need to get the IP address, and you can just find the IP address of any given device on Linux by opening the terminal and typing ifconfig, which is basically the same thing as the ipconfig command on Windows, if you ever use that. And WLAN 0 is, uh, is wireless. If your device is plugged into the internet via a, uh, an IEEE cable, I think it'll just say LAN or LAN 0 or something. But in any case, in my, in my, uh, in my case, it's uh, WLAN 0 down at the bottom. The address that you're looking for is the IP4 address, uh, 192.168.126 in my case. In your case, it might be something else, depending on the IP address that your router is, decides to assign to it. If you're into setting up static IP addresses and whatever, I'm, I'm sure you can do that also, but this is good enough for me. Now, back over here on the, on, the, uh, on the desktop computer, you will need a program called Extra Putty or any other uh, SSH terminal. Uh, the one that I use and the one that is probably most common to be used is called Extra Putty. So if you type Extra Putty or Extra Putty SSH into, uh, into your search engine of choice, you will find it. ExtraPutty.com, I suppose, is the, um, is the website. If you're doing this from another computer running Linux, I believe there is just a command that lets you SSH into something directly. Anyway, uh, find, the, uh, find the download. That'll probably be it. Once it's downloaded, uh, run the installer. I already have Putty installed, so I don't especially need to set this up, but very much like the Raspberry Pi imaging software, it's, um, it's pretty straightforward and it shouldn't ask you to install any like promotional adware or anything like that. Once you run it, you're going to notice a couple things. The main one being that it looks like software from about 2001, and that's mainly kind of because it is. Number two, there's a lot of stuff in this interface, and that's you don't need most of it. Uh, the only thing you really need is to type the IP address of the Raspberry Pi into where it says host name, 192.168.1.26 in my case. This, this little message is going to pop up. This happens the first time you try to connect to a device uh, via SSH. This is a lot of like computer security jargon, but all it's really asking is if this is the device that you think you're connecting to and then it's not trying to do anything malicious because I am the one who set up the Raspberry Pi and it is currently sitting on my desk over there and not in a server in some far off country full of scary people doing scary things or whatever, I can just click yes. And this is going to ask me for a username, which is, I guess, Pi. And it's going to ask me for a password. And between when I set up the Raspberry Pi a couple hours ago and now I have forgotten the password, but I think it was that. It won't show the password. That wasn't me like blanking out the video or anything. It won't show the password as you type it in, but it will be there if you're typing things and the window is active. Uh, as soon as you hit the enter key, if you typed in the password correctly, it should accept it, as you can see. And now you have remote access to your Raspberry Pi. This is important for a number of things. If you're using games and you're working on Windows and you want to connect to the Raspberry Pi in order to build games for it and run games on it, you're going to need a way to connect to it. And this would be how you do it. There are also tasks such as I occasionally use my Raspberry Pi to run a Discord bot so that I don't have to pay Amazon Web Services or anything like that for hosting. And when you do that, it's nice to be able to be able to access it remotely and just SSH into the Raspberry Pi without, without having to go through the whole plugging it into a monitor thing. Anyway, if I were to type in some commands, such as the ls command to list all of the files and folders, you can see the test program and test.c are where I was, or where they, um, are there, which I created earlier in this video. Uh, if I were to show the contents of test.c in the terminal, you can see what it is. GCF. Compile it, run it, do whatever you want. Still, it still is missing the terminating null. Let me, uh, let me actually fix that real quick. What is it? Um, control O to write and Control X to quit. That was Control something else. Much better. For all intents and purposes, I am now running a terminal on the Raspberry Pi itself. I just happen to not actually be on the Raspberry Pi itself. This does get weird if you try to run stuff that use a graphical user interface. In fact, I don't know off the top of my head if you can really do that at all without jumping through a lot of hoops. 
Simple stuff like the nano text editor that I had open a minute ago uh, obviously work. I think even more visually complicated programs that you might run on the command line, what is it, HTOP is basically the, um, the terminal version of Task Manager. Even this will work, and I think you can, um, wrong mouse, I think you can even interact with it. You can click on these little headers to sort by, um, sort by, by value. See what's using the most CPU on the Raspberry Pi. Anyway, that was the last thing I wanted to show. At this point, you are now all set up to use Game Maker Studio 2 to run games on your Raspberry Pi. You can do a surprising amount with this. You can even install things like GIMP, the GNU image manipulation program. They gave it that name on purpose, apparently. And um, even Kaden Live, the video editor, on your Raspberry Pi. I don't exactly recommend actually using those because, once again, one gigahertz quad-core ARM CPU that's running off an SD card with no dedicated graphics. I actually did try editing video on a Raspberry Pi 4. It was not a fun time. But just because this thing can't compete with a $1,000 gaming computer doesn't mean it's not useful. Again, you could use it as a media player, you could use it as a retro arcade machine, you can use it as a file server or web server. Now that the laptop computer that I used to use for this purpose is basically almost dead, I'm probably going to just be using a Raspberry Pi as like a traveling computer. Something that I'll just take with me whenever I like go visit relatives or go to Magfest or whatever, assuming that ever happens again, if the plague ever gets under control. Anyway, go nuts, go to town, have fun. Don't use your newfound powers for evil. Uh, my name is Michael, I like wizards and dragons and making games. I try to post a couple of these videos a week. I have a Patreon, so if you want to contribute towards these videos being made, there's links to that in all the usual places. Otherwise, I hope you found this useful, and I will see you all later. Special thanks to Edward Holt, Indie Punch, Jason, and Zenith for supporting these videos. If you want your name in the credits or to hear yourself shouted out at the end, head over to the Patreon page in the video description to join the fun.